Hey everybody, it's your old pal John. Uh, this is Humor and History, and today it's, what is this, Mirz al-Kabir, where the, uh, why the British attacked their French allies in World War II. This is one of those uh, uh, questions of history that uh, has a lot of controversy. Um, it's, it's an interesting one. I've never heard the full explanation for it, but let's, let's find out. When the British attacked their French allies on purpose, the attack on Mirz el Kabir, yeah. July 3rd, 1940. On June 22nd, 1940, France signed an armistice with Germany, thus effectively ending their participation in the conflict. The French Third Republic ceased to exist and was now occupied by the Germans. The unoccupied part of France, the territory in the south of the country, and the colonial empire was put under the control of the French state. The new right. state, run by the government in Vichy, took a neutral stand in the war, but was to be monitored from Germany. This newly established French neutrality posed a major problem for their former allies, Great Britain. The French fleet, which was still intact, was seen as a serious threat, especially if the Axis forces managed to commandeer it and use it against them. Before you know, it's important to note that in 1940, you're looking, when you're looking at the fascist uh, governments, in in Europe, and this is mainly more for the American people. Um, you're looking at Germany, you're looking at Italy, you're looking at Spain, and you know are, are they're surrounded, uh, surrounding France. So when you talk about the government of Vichy and having a large fleet like this, and then being able to hold on to their colonies, you know you. <laughs> It's not unheard of that people were sympathetic at this particular time and that you could put people in government that were uh, fascist in nature. Um, you know, you know, win or lose, that's what was going on at the time. Context is everything. This isn't 1943. This isn't 19, even 42, but this happened in 1940. It was a real decision. The British, uh, the Admiralty itself, I mean, uh, the British Navy, the Royal Navy um, was you know, having a hard time even just keeping up uh, with things that were naval-wise that were going on, but they still had the Brit uh, the biggest navy, and uh, France was, was right up there. And then if you got the French navy involved with the Italian navy, I mean, things would have, you know, could have really changed uh, for the worse in the Mediterranean. Before World War II, the French Marine Nationale underwent a process of modernization by building new improved classes of destroyers and battleships. In 1940, the French Navy was among the most powerful navies in the world, yeah. along with those of Great Britain, the United States, Japan, and Italy. Its main task was the protection of the routes between metropolitan France and its colonies. With the war approaching, Admiral Francois Dallon, Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, anticipated that the majority of the fleet would be engaged in the Mediterranean theater against the Italian Regia Marina. When, on May 10, 1940, Germany attacked France, there was little the French Navy could do about it. It was the Army and the Air Force that took the brunt of the onslaught from the invading German forces. Right. Only when Italy entered the war on June 10th did Admiral Darlan order his ships to attack industrial installations along the Italian coast. Until June 22nd and the signing of the armistice, there had been no significant clashes between the French and the Italian Mediterranean fleets. Right. Under the conditions of the armistice, the French state was allowed to keep its entire navy, but under certain conditions, like the rest of the armed forces, to keep it neutral in any further conflicts. Ships were to be anchored in metropolitan and colonial ports. Mm. The majority of the Navy went along with the conditions of the armistice and sided with the Vichy government. Several ships, however, were placed under British custody. These were ships that had taken shelter in the English ports of Plymouth and Portsmouth and right. Alexandria in Egypt before the armistice was signed. These ships remained under the command of their French commanders who were loyal to the Vichy, but who were restrained from any combat activity. Despite the open antagonism shown by the Vichy government to them, the British were not overly concerned that they would actually violate the terms of the armistice. But what they did fear was what if the German military commandeered the whole French fleet and combined it with their own to use against them. This yes. was despite assurances from the French that they would scuttle the fleet if such a thing happened. 
The British War Cabinet preferred not to leave anything to chance. If the Germans did manage to get their hands on the French fleet, the British would lose supremacy in the Mediterranean, and yeah. subsequently North Africa and the Middle East. Therefore, the British decided to deal with the French ships themselves. They instigated Operation Catapult with the intention to either seize or neutralize as much of the French Navy as they could. The French fleet in the Mediterranean was stationed in the port of Toulon in France and several ports in Algeria. The naval base in Toulon was heavily protected and thus presented a bigger challenge than the Algerian ones. Mm -hmm. For that reason, the port of Mers el Kabir near Oran was picked as a target. To eliminate any potential threat coming from the French fleet, the British assembled their fleet in Gibraltar, designated Force H. Its commander, Vice Admiral Sir James Somerville, received an order to present the French Admiral Marcel Bruno Gensoul in Mers el Kabir with an ultimatum to hand over the fleet under his command. I often thought that this was such a uh, such an audacious plan. I mean, uh, not that not that Great Britain had anything really to lose by by doing this. I mean, but they they I mean, well, they could. I mean, the Vichy could the Vichy uh, Navy, who was generally more pro Vichy than the the Third Republic. I mean, they could they could align with the Germans, so you're essentially taking something out of the equation. But you know, the other thing that I always uh, was interested in is, you know, it it could have been a quite a quite a rough battle for the British, and and to a certain extent, I guess it was, if if I recall, was very tough on the Royal Navy, I should say, the Royal Navy. So I, I'm interested in this, and I, my memory has faded a little bit as to how this happened. But given the ultimatum, I mean. And, well, we'll see as we go in here. The alternative plan was to attack the fleet and neutralize it. Somerville disapproved of such an approach, but the cabinet and especially Winston Churchill insisted that he carry out the order without delay. On July 3rd, 1940, ships of Force H approached the coast of Algeria, HMS Foxhound carrying Captain C.S. Holland, the officer tasked with delivering the ultimatum, continued toward Merz... Holland, wasn't it, wasn't his uh, nickname Holland Mad? El Kabir. Or, it might be a Since the guy. HMS Foxhound entering the port would be a violation of the armistice, Admiral Gensoul refused to let it in. Instead, Captain Holland embarked on a motorboat and headed into the harbor. Offended that Admiral Somerville was only sending ah. a captain as his emissary, Gensoul refused to meet him and sent his flag lieutenant instead, to whom Captain Holland delivered the British ultimatum. The French were offered five options. One, sail with the British. I had no idea they were they were offered five options. I thought, you know, come to think of it, I don't even remember what they had offered them. This is interesting. Addition, continue the fight against Germany and Italy. Okay, yeah. Two, sail to a British port with reduced crews where the ships would be safeguarded until hostilities were over. Number two. Okay, that's what I thought they were given the option to do. They sail to a British port. Or sail to a neutral port, I guess. That's what I had thought happened. Okay. Three, sail with reduced crews to a French West Indies port where the ships could be demilitarized or entrusted to the safekeeping of the United States. Don't give anything to the United States. I think we're starting to learn that. Four, sink all ships within six hours. Five, face the use of whatever force may be necessary option to prevent the French fleet from falling into German or Italian hands. Mm. At 10 hundred hours, Admiral Gensoul delivered his reply. By the way, five are all very viable options when you're in a war zone. You know, I, I it makes me kind of wonder what was going on with the Spanish Navy, although they didn't have much to speak of. Um, yeah. Repeating assurances that the French fleet would never enter the war on the German side. At the same time, he warned that his ships would retaliate if the British attacked them. By that time... It's tough to buy that. Like, don't worry, we're not going to enter on the German side. However, we are part of... We did agree. Most of the, the uh, French Navy did agree to uh, be part of the Vichy government, which was created by the by the Germans. So I can understand that being 
Not good enough a response. I'm Force Age had appeared on the horizon, waiting for Captain Holland to return with the news. After almost an entire day of negotiations, Holland left the harbor at 1725 hours. At the same time, Somerville ordered his fleet to assume their bombardment stations. British Force H consisted of the battle cruiser HMS Hood, two battleships HMS Resolution and HMS Valiant, the aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal, two light cruisers, and 11 destroyers. The French Force du Raid in By the way, I have to say, I at this point in the war, and this is a very early in the war, this is after the Sitzkrieg, this is after the invasion of France, the what the French did, what the um British did with their navy to me is just fascinating. You talk about having whatever you have in your in your hands, whatever you're whatever you're able to carry, um, metaphorically speaking. And in this case, they have a great uh, a great um, sea power. They use this insanely well. Invasion of Madagascar, stretching all the way out even to Singapore and. I mean, even though that's still considered the greatest military, def I think, defeat in British history, still being able to send something out there to hold that is, is to me, uh, amazing. And the fact they were even a hold, able to hold on in the Mediterranean alone was, was fascinating. And guard the straits between Calais, Dover, and all the ports of England, and as well as uh, when the U.S. gets involved in the war, being able to do the convoys there, the convoys going into Russia soon. Uh, and then on top of that, getting involved in uh, landings and, you know, support, uh, supply and support um, uh, areas in Africa, the Middle East, to a certain extent, um, you know, Greece, Crete, all this stuff. And of course, HMS Hood's right involved in that. Same with... Um, what was it? Reliance. They were involved in the invasion of Madagascar. One of those things that people don't get is that, yeah, British invaded Madagascar. Very, very interesting. Uh, uh, and I think extremely uh, good. And when it comes to the, the British and creativity, uh, it is blossoming to me at this point. I think it's one of the great um achievements uh if you're if you're british you, you, the creativity that comes out in the time of need is to me is just fascinating and i'm in awe of it Merzel kabir comprised four battleships strasbourg dunkirk provence and britannia several destroyers two torpedo boats and the seaplane carrier the commandant test it was clear that the british had the advantage of the open sea they were able to maneuver freely while the French ships were confined in the harbor with their bows facing the shore. Moreover, the French ships were already in the process of demobilizing, and most yeah. of the sailors were ashore. Admiral Gensol was simply not ready to fight. Before Somerville ordered his forces to open... And that goes to, sh that goes to prove the point that they were not ready to... Uh, that they were not willing to join either side. Um, so... But I mean, how would the British know for fire? Six fairy swordfish escorted by three Blackburn Skua aircraft from HMS Ark Royal. Swordfish. Magnetic All mines right. at the harbor entrance to prevent the French ships from escaping. Great planes for. At 1754 hours, guns from HMS Resolution and HMS Valiant fired the first shots. Resolution, that was it. Stunned that the British ships were actually firing at him, Gensoul ordered his fleet to return fire. His plan now was to leave the harbor as quickly as possible and form a battle line to confront the British in the open sea. It was quite a difficult task with shells constantly raining down from the British ships. Yeah. The first ship to be hit was the battleship Breton, whose stern was hit by a round from a British salvo. The hit caused a devastating explosion that sent metal debris along with the bodies of sailors high into the air. Within moments, the ship burst into flames. The second to be hit was the large destroyer Mogador. As it was steaming towards the harbor exit, its bow was blown away by a shell that detonated the destroyer's depth charges. Oh, wow. Unable to continue, Mogador anchored in shallow waters. After the initial shock, the French finally responded by opening fire, first from Provence and then from Dunkirk. The latter fired only 40 rounds before a British round hit its boiler room, disrupting its electrical distribution system. 
This significant damage impaired the ship's performance, and its commander had no option but to run the ship ashore. Right. While Provence waited for Dunkirk to get out of the way, it too was hit. A round opened a gap in its hull, letting water in. Out of four battleships, only Strasbourg was still operational after the initial ten minutes of shelling. To the astonishment of the British, it emerged from the harbor, followed by four large destroyers. None of them were struck by the mines that the British had dropped at the harbor entrance. Mm. Fifteen minutes after the attack had started, at 18.09 hours, Strasbourg left the harbor and turned northeast. At 18.34 hours, Somerville reacted by ordering his light cruisers and destroyers to follow in pursuit. The two battleships HMS Resolution and HMS Valiant remained at Merzel Kabir. The pursuit was pointless, though, as Strasbourg was already 18 miles ahead of them. That's crazy. At 20.25 hours, Somerville broke off the pursuit as the Strasbourg was too far away and, more importantly, had been joined by destroyers and motorboats from Oran and cruisers from Algiers. When word of the attack on Merzel Kabir had reached these two ports, ships stationed there had left them in a great hurry, fearing that the British might attack them as well. At 2155 hours, Somerville ordered one last attack by Ferry Swordfish aircraft armed with torpedoes. The attack on Merzel Kabir was not the only one conducted that day. On the morning oh. of July 3rd, the British Royal Navy stormed French vessels stationed in Plymouth, Portsmouth, and Alexandria. Well, that, of course, that makes sense. Yeah, do it all in one day. It's the shock value. The, um, the Japanese had great success doing it in Pearl Harbor. They did uh, uh, within, it was like, within like a month, but initially for the first day of December 7th, there was December 8th. And all these things happened all at once. It's what you want to do. You want to keep every, so there's no communication. I didn't think there was much chance in, terms of this but the retaliation re question would come up after such a large operation like this what was it catapult i think and um yeah i mean you don't know what the res the response is going to be it could be very angry and they could take sides with the germans just for the sheer fact of being attacked even though it's a kind of quasi ally it's an awkward position like what do you do um i did not realize that the the British stormed the, the ships. Um, injury, uh, interesting to me. Yeah. In English ports, they took control of two old battleships, two large destroyers, and two fleet destroyers, seven submarines, and 44 other vessels. The success came at the cost of the lives of two Royal Navy officers and one French sailor. To me, that is actually... Uh, I don't think that's... Uh, I don't like when anybody dies, but... That's actually not um, bad when it comes to casualties. I would expect it a lot more, to be honest. In Alexandria, Vice Admiral Rene Godfroy, in command of one battleship, four cruisers, three destroyers, and one submarine, decided not to resist the British. In return for letting him continue to command his fleet, Godfroy agreed to reduce the crews on board his ships, empty their fuel tanks, and remove the guns' breech blocks and deposit them at the French consulate. That's fair. The outcome of the Merzel Kabir attack was tragic, to say the least, including the additional attack on Dunkirk on July 8th. I want to say, if I recall correctly, there was, gosh, it was like a thousand casualties? Two thousand, maybe? French lost 1,648 men, of which 1,297 were killed. Yeah. It was a heavy loss of that life was... for a relatively small... And if I remember correctly, too, the French, I mean, the understandably so the french were pissed but I, I i i get why i i get why the british did it result the force maritimes francaise the navy of the vichy french still remained a force to be reckoned with yeah but at reduced when in november 1942 the germans conducted operation anton the military occupation of vichy france the french kept their word and scuttled the entire yeah. fleet in toulon the Germans never managed to get a hold of the mighty French Navy. French officers and sailors had honored the old alliance despite the tragic outcome of the Meurs el Kabir attack. Amazing. All right, to me that is, uh, I think that's fascinating. I think that's one of those decisions in history that is a very tough one to make. And um, I, I think not many other than, you know, some of the more major 
uh, people that study World War II history um, don't know that. So even in the States, of course, because let's face it, uh, if you're in the United States, the, the World War II doesn't start until 1941. And yes, I've heard in the comments that we didn't need to be involved. You guys could have won anyway with Britain and Russia. I understand that. I get, I get those points. Nonetheless, this is, uh, to me, fascinating. More Americans should be studying this. British, I know if you're British, you study this. Guys, thank you for watching with me and um, reacting with me. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It helps the channel grow, you know, and it gets more, hopefully, Americans involved in what the British did in terms of world history. That's really one of the goals when I when I do the videos on, uh, on Britain, and I'm hoping more Americans watch this. So send this to an American friend. Cheers, everybody. Have a great day and have a pint.